Book Two, Chapter Four of Les Miserables, translated by Isabel F. Hapgood. Les Miserables, by Victor Hugo. Book Two, The Fall. Chapter Four, Details Concerning the Cheese Dairies of Pontarlier. Now, in order to convey an idea of what happened at that table, we cannot do better than to transcribe here a passage from one of Mademoiselle Baptistine's letters to Madame Boischevron, wherein the conversation between the convict and the bishop is described with ingenious minuteness. This man paid no attention to any one. He ate with the veracity of a starving man. However, after supper he said, Monsieur le curé of the good God, all this is far too good for me, but I must say that the carters, who would not allow me to eat with them, keep a better table than you do. Between ourselves, the remark rather shocked me. My brother replied, They are more fatigued than I. No, returned the man, they have more money. You are poor, I see that plainly. You cannot be even a curate. Are you really a curé? Ah, oh, if the good God were but just, you certainly ought to be a curé. The good God is more than just, said my brother. A moment later he added, Monsieur Jean Valjean, is it to Pontarlier that you are going? With my road marked out for me. I think that is what the man said. Then he went on, I must be on my way by daybreak tomorrow. Traveling is hard. If the nights are cold, the days are hot. You are going to a good country, said my brother. During the revolution, my family was ruined. I took refuge in Franche Comte at first, and there I lived for some time by the toil of my hands. My will was good. I found plenty to occupy me. One has only to choose. There are paper mills, tanneries, distilleries, oil factories, watch factories on a large scale, steel mills, copper works, twenty iron foundries at least, four of which, situated at Lodes, at Châtillon, at Anincourt, and at Berre, are tolerably large. I think I am not mistaken in saying that those are the names which my brother mentioned. Then he interrupted himself and addressed me. Have we not some relatives in those parts, my dear sister? I replied, we did have some. Among others, Monsieur de Lucenay, who was captain of the gates at Pontarlier under the old regime. Yes, resumed my brother, but in ninety-three one had no longer any relatives, one had only one's arms. I worked. They have in the country of Pontarlier, whither you are going, Monsieur Valjean, a truly patriarchal and truly charming industry, my sister. It is their cheese dairies, which they call fruitière. Then my brother, while urging the man to eat, explained to him, with great minuteness, what these fruitières of Pontalier were, that they were divided into two classes, the big barns which belong to the rich, and where there are forty or fifty cows, which produce from seven to eight thousand cheeses each summer, and the associated fruitière, which belong to the poor. These are the peasants of Mid Mountain, who hold their cows in common and share the proceeds. They engage the services of cheesemaker, whom they call the Grurin. The Grurin receives the milk of the associates three times a day and marks the quantity on a double tally. It is towards the end of April that the work of the cheese dairies begins. It is towards the middle of June that the cheesemakers drive their cows to the mountain. The man recovered his animation as he ate. My brother made him drink that good mauve wine, which he does not drink himself, because he says that wine is expensive. My brother imparted all these details, with that easy gaiety of his, with which you are acquainted, interspersing his words with graceful attentions to me. He recurred frequently to that comfortable trade of Grurin, as though he wished the man to understand, without advising him directly and harshly, that this would afford him a refuge. One thing struck me. This man was what I have told you. Well, neither during supper, nor during the entire evening, did my brother utter a single word, with the exception of a few words about Jesus when he entered, which could remind the man of what he was, nor of what my brother was. To all appearances, it was the occasion for preaching him a little sermon, and of impressing the bishop on the convict, 
so that a mark of the passage might remain behind. This might have appeared to any one else who had this unfortunate man in his hands, to afford a chance to nourish his soul as well as his body, and to bestow upon him some reproach, seasoned with moralizing advice, or a little commiseration, with an exhortation to conduct himself better in the future. My brother did not even ask him from what country he came, nor what was his history, for in his history there was a fault, and my brother seemed to avoid everything which could remind him of it. To such a point did he carry it, that at one time, when my brother, who was speaking of the mountaineers of Pontalier, who exercise a gentle labor near heaven, and who, he added, are happy because they are innocent, he stopped short, fearing lest in this remark there might have escaped him something which might wound the man. By dint of reflection, I think I have comprehended what was passing in my brother's heart. He was thinking, no doubt, that this man, whose name is Jean Valjean, had his misfortune only too vividly present in his mind, and that the best thing was to divert him from it, and to make him believe, if only momentarily, that he was a person like any other, by treating him in just his ordinary way. Is this not indeed to understand charity well? Is there not, dear madame, something truly evangelical in this delicacy which abstains from sermon, from moralizing, from illusions? And is not the truest pity, when a man has a sore point, not to touch it at all? It has seemed to me that this might have been my brother's private thought. In any case, what I can say is that, if he entertained all these ideas, he gave no sign of them. From beginning to end, even to me, he was the same as he is every evening, and he supped with his Jean Valjean, with the same air, and in the same manner, in which he might have supped with Monsieur Guédillon le Provost, or with the curates of the parish. Towards the end, when he had reached the figs, there came a knock at the door. It was Mother Gerbeau, with her little one in her arms. My brother kissed the child on the brow, and borrowed fifteen sous which I had about me, to give to Mother Gerbeau. The man was not paying much heed to anything then. He was no longer talking, and he seemed very much fatigued. After poor old Gerbeau had taken her departure, my brother said grace. Then he turned to the man and said to him, You must be in great need of your bed. Madame Magliori cleared the table very promptly. I understood that we must retire, in order to allow this traveller to go to sleep, and we both went upstairs. Nevertheless, I sent Madame Magliori down a moment later to carry to the man's bed a goatskin from the black forest which was in my room. The nights are frigid, and that keeps one warm. It is a pity that this skin is old. All the hair is falling out. My brother bought it while he was in Germany, at Tottlingen, near the sources of the Danube, as well as the little ivory-handled knife which I use at table. Madame Macleori returned immediately. We said our prayers in the drawing-room, where we hang up the linen, and then we each retired to our own chambers, without saying a word to each other. End of Book Two, Chapter Four. Book Two, Chapter Five of Les Miserables, translated by Isabel F. Hapgood. Book Two, The Fall, Chapter Five, Tranquility. After bidding his sister good night, Monseigneur Bienvenu took one of the two silver candlesticks from the table, handed the other to his guest, and said to him. Monsieur, I will conduct you to your room. The man followed him. As might have been observed from what has been said above, the house was so arranged that in order to pass into the oratory where the alcove was situated, or to get out of it, it was necessary to traverse the bishop's bedroom. At the moment when he was crossing this apartment, Madame Maglore was putting away the silverware in the cupboard near the head of the bed. This was her last care every evening before she went to bed. The bishop installed his guest in the alcove. A fresh white bed had been prepared there. The man set the candle down on a small table. Well, said the bishop, may you pass a good night. Tomorrow morning, before you set out, you shall drink a cup of warm milk from our cows. Thanks, Monsieur l'Abbé, said the man. 
Hardly had he pronounced these words full of peace, when all of a sudden, and without transition, he made a strange movement, which would have frozen the two sainted women with horror had they witnessed it. Even at this day it is difficult for us to explain what inspired him at that moment. Did he intend to convey a warning, or to throw out a menace? Was he simply obeying a sort of instinctive impulse which was obscure even to himself? He turned abruptly to the old man, folded his arms, and bending upon his host a savage gaze, he exclaimed in a hoarse voice, Ah, really, you lodge me in your house, close to yourself like this? He broke off, and added with a laugh, in which there lurked something monstrous, Ha! Have you really reflected well? How do you know that I have not been an assassin? The bishop replied, That is the concern of the good God. Then gravely, and moving his lips like one who is praying or talking to himself, he raised two fingers of his right hand and bestowed his benediction on the man, who did not bow, and without turning his head or looking behind him, he returned to his bedroom. When the alcove was in use, a large serge curtain drawn from wall to wall concealed the altar. The bishop knelt before this curtain as he passed and said a brief prayer. A moment later he was in his garden, walking, meditating, contemplating, his heart and soul wholly absorbed in those grand and mysterious things which God shows at night to the eyes which remain open. As for the man, he was actually so fatigued that he did not even profit by the nice white sheets. Snuffing out his candle with his nostrils after the manner of convicts, he dropped, all dressed as he was, upon the bed, where he immediately fell into a profound sleep. Midnight struck as the bishop returned from his garden to his apartment. A few minutes later, all were asleep in the little house. End of Book Two, Chapter Five Book Two, Chapter Six of Les Miserables Translated by Isabel F. Hapgood Les Miserables by Victor Hugo Book Two, The Fall Chapter 6. Jean Valjean Towards the middle of the night, Jean Valjean woke. Jean Valjean came from a poor peasant family of Brie. He had not learned to read in his childhood. When he reached man's estate, he became a tree pruner at Favaroles. His mother was named Jean Matou. His father was called Jean Valjean, or Valjean, probably a sobriquet, and a contraction of Vola Jean. Here's Jean. Jean Valjean was of that thoughtful but not gloomy disposition which constitutes the peculiarity of affectionate natures. On the whole, however, there was something decidedly sluggish and insignificant about Jean Valjean, in appearance at least. He had lost his father and mother at a very early age. His mother had died of a milk fever, which had not been properly attended to. His father, a tree pruner like himself, had been killed by a fall from a tree. All that remained to Jean Valjean was a sister older than himself, a widow with seven children, boys and girls. This sister had brought up Jean Valjean, and so long as she had had a husband, she lodged and fed her young brother. The husband died. The eldest of the seven children was eight years old, the youngest, one. Jean Valjean had just attained his twenty-fifth year. He took the father's place, and in his turn supported the sister who had brought him up. This was done simply as a duty, and even a little churlishly on the part of Jean Valjean. Thus his youth had been spent in rude and ill-paid toil. He had never known a kind woman friend in his native parts. He had not had the time to fall in love. He returned at night weary, and ate his broth without uttering a word. His sister, Mother Jean, often took the best part of his repast from his bowl while he was eating, a bit of meat, a slice of bacon, the heart of the cabbage, to give to one of her children. As he went on eating, with his head bent over the table and almost into his soup, his long hair falling about his bowl and concealing his eyes, he had the air of perceiving nothing and allowing it. There was at Favaroles, not far from the Valjean thatched cottage, on the other side of the lane, a farmer's wife named Marie-Claude. The Valjean children, habitually famished, 
sometimes went to borrow from Marie Claude a pint of milk in their mother's name, which they drank behind a hedge or in some alley corner, snatching the jug from each other so hastily that the little girls spilled it on their aprons and down their necks. If their mother had known of this marauding, she would have punished the delinquents severely. Jean Valjean gruffly and grumblingly played Marie Claude for the pint of milk behind their mother's back, and the children were not punished. In pruning season, he earned 18 sous a day. Then he hired out as a haymaker, as laborer, as neat herd on a farm, as a drudge. He did whatever he could. His sister worked also, but what could she do with seven little children? It was a sad group enveloped in misery, which was being gradually annihilated. A very hard winter came. Jean had no work. The family had no bread. No bread, literally. Seven children. One Sunday evening, Maubert Isabeau, the baker on the church square at Faverolles, was preparing to go to bed when he heard a violent blow on the grated front of his shop. He arrived in time to see an arm passed through the hole made by a blow from a fist, through the grating and the glass. The arm seized a loaf of bread and carried it off. Isabeau ran out in haste. The robber fled at the full speed of his legs. Isabeau ran after him and stopped him. The thief had flung away the loaf, but his arm was still bleeding. It was Jean Valjean. This took place in 1795. Jean Valjean was taken before the tribunals of the time for theft and breaking and entering an inhabited house at night. He had a gun which he had used better than anyone else in the world. He was a bit of a poacher, and this injured his case. There exists a legitimate prejudice against poachers. The poacher, like the smuggler, smacks too strongly of the brigand. Nevertheless, we will remark cursorily, there is still an abyss between these races of men and the hideous assassin of the towns. The poacher lives in the forest. The smuggler lives in the mountains or on the sea. The cities make ferocious men because they make corrupt men. The mountain, the sea, the forest make savage men. They develop the fierce side, but often without destroying the humane side. Jean Valjean was pronounced guilty. The terms of the code were explicit. There occur formidable hours in our civilization. There are moments when the penal laws decree a shipwreck. What an ominous minute is that in which society draws back and consummates the irreparable abandonment of a sentient being. Jean Valjean was condemned to five years in the galleys. On the 22nd of April, 1796, the victory of Montenot, won by the general-in-chief of the Army of Italy, whom the message of the directory to the 500, of the 2nd of Floreal, year 4, calls Buonaparte, was announced in Paris. On that same day, a great gang of galley slaves was put in chains at Bicetre. Jean Valjean formed a part of that gang. An old turnkey of the prison, who is now nearly eighty years old, still recalls perfectly that unfortunate wretch who was chained to the end of the fourth line, in the north angle of the courtyard. He was seated on the ground like the others. He did not seem to comprehend his position, except that it was horrible. It is probable that he also was disentangling from amid the vague ideas of a poor man, ignorant of everything, something excessive. While the bolt of his iron collar was being riveted behind his head with heavy blows from the hammer, he wept. His tears stifled him. They impeded his speech. He only managed to say from time to time, I was a tree pruner at Faverolles. Then, still sobbing, he raised his right hand and lowered it gradually seven times, as though he were touching in succession seven heads of unequal heights. And from this gesture it was divined that the thing which he had done, whatever it was, had been done for the sake of clothing and nourishing seven little children. He set out for Toulon. He arrived there, after a journey of twenty-seven days, on a cart with a chain on his neck. At Toulon he was clothed in the red cassock. All that had constituted his life, even to his name, was effaced. He was no longer even Jean Valjean. He was number 24,601. What became of his sister? What became of the seven children? Who troubled himself about that? 
What becomes of the handful of leaves from the young tree which is sawed off at the root? It is always the same story. These poor living beings, these creatures of God, henceforth without support, without guide, without refuge, wandered away at random. Who even knows, each in his own direction perhaps, and little by little buried themselves in that cold mist which engulfs solitary destinies, gloomy shades into which disappear in succession so many unlucky heads, in the somber march of the human race. They quitted the country. The clock tower of what had been their village forgot them. The boundary line of what had been their field forgot them. After a few years' residence in the galleys, Jean Valjean himself forgot them. In that heart, where there had been a wound, there was a scar. That is all. Only once, during all the time which he spent at Toulon, did he hear his sister mentioned. This happened, I think, towards the end of the fourth year of his captivity. I know not through what channels the news reached him. Someone who had known them in their own country had seen his sister. She was in Paris. She lived in a poor street, rear sans sulpice in the Rue de Gendre. She had with her only one child, a little boy, the youngest. Where were the other six? Perhaps she did not know herself. Every morning she went to a printing office, number three, Rue de Sabat, where she was a folder and stitcher. She was obliged to be there at six o'clock in the morning, long before daylight in winter. In the same building with the printing office there was a school, and to this school she took her little boy, who was seven years old. But as she entered the printing office at six, and the school only opened at seven, the child had to wait in the courtyard for the school to open for an hour, one hour of a winter night in the open air. They would not allow the child to come into the printing office, because he was in the way, they said. When the workmen passed in the morning, they beheld this poor little being seated on the pavement, overcome with drowsiness, and often fast asleep in the shadow, crouched down and doubled up over his basket. When it rained, an old woman, the portress, took pity on him. She took him into her den, where there was a pallet, a spinning wheel, and two wooden chairs, and the little one slumbered in a corner, pressing himself close to the cat that he might suffer less from cold. At seven o'clock the school opened, and he entered. This is what was told to Jean Valjean. They talked to him about it for one day. It was a moment, a flash, as though a window had suddenly been opened upon the destiny of those things whom he had loved, then all closed again. He heard nothing more forever. Nothing from them ever reached him again. He never beheld them. He never met them again. And in the continuation of this mournful history, they will not be met with any more. Towards the end of this fourth year, Jean Valjean's turn to escape arrived. His comrades assisted him, as is the custom in that sad place. He escaped. He wandered for two days in the fields at liberty. If being at liberty is to be hunted, to turn the head every instant, to quake at the slightest noise, to be afraid of everything, of a smoking roof, of a passing man, of a barking dog, of a galloping horse, of a striking clock, of the day because one can see, of the night because one cannot see, of the highway, of the path, of a bush, of sleep. On the evening of the second day he was captured. He had neither eaten nor slept for thirty-six hours. The Maritime Tribunal condemned him, for this crime, to a prolongation of his term for three years, which made eight years. In the sixth year his turn to escape occurred again. He availed himself of it, but could not accomplish his flight fully. He was missing at roll call. The cannon were fired, and at night the patrol found him hidden under the keel of a vessel in process of construction. He resisted the galley guards who seized him. Escape and Rebellion this case, provided for by a special code, was punished by an addition of five years, two of them in the double chain. Thirteen years. In the tenth year his turn came round again. He again profited by it. He succeeded no better. Three years for this fresh attempt. Sixteen years. Finally, I think it was during his thirteenth year, he made a last attempt. 
and only succeeded in getting retaken at the end of four hours of absence. Three years for those four hours. Nineteen years. In October 1815, he was released. He had entered there in 1796 for having broken a pane of glass and taken a loaf of bread. Room for a brief parenthesis. This is the second time during his studies on the penal question and damnation by law that the author of this book has come across the theft of a loaf of bread as the point of departure for the disaster of a destiny. Claude Gaux had stolen a loaf. Jean Valjean had stolen a loaf. English statistics prove the fact that four thefts out of five in London have hunger for their immediate cause. Jean Valjean had entered the galley sobbing and shuddering. He emerged impassive. He had entered in despair. He emerged gloomy. What had taken place in that soul? End of Book Two, Chapter Six. Book Two, Chapter Seven of Les Misérables, translated by Isabel F. Hapgood. Les Misérables by Victor Hugo. Book Two, Chapter Seven. The Interior of Despair. Let us try to say it. It is necessary that society should look at these things, because it is itself which creates them. He was, as we have said, an ignorant man, but he was not a fool. The light of nature was ignited in him. Unhappiness, which also possesses a clearness of vision of its own, augmented the small amount of daylight which existed in this mind. Beneath the cudgel, beneath the chain, in the cell, in hardship, beneath the burning sun of the galleys, upon the plank bed of the convict, he withdrew into his own consciousness and meditated. He constituted himself the tribunal. He began by putting himself on trial. He recognized the fact that he was not an innocent man unjustly punished. He admitted that he had committed an extreme and blameworthy act, that that loaf of bread would probably not have been refused to him had he asked for it, that, in any case, it would have been better to wait until he could get it through compassion or through work, that it is not an unanswerable argument to say, can one wait when one is hungry, that, in the first place, it is very rare for anyone to die of hunger, literally, and next, that, fortunately or unfortunately, man is so constituted that he can suffer long and much, both morally and physically, without dying, that it is therefore necessary to have patience, that that would even have been better for those poor little children, that it had been an act of madness for him, a miserable, unfortunate wretch, to take society at large violently by the collar, and to imagine that one can escape from misery through theft that that is in any case a poor door through which to escape from misery through which infamy enters, in short, that he was in the wrong. Then he asked himself whether he had been the only one in fault in his fatal history, whether it was not a serious thing that he, a laborer out of work, that he, an industrious man, should have lacked bread, and whether, the fault once committed and confessed, the chastisement had not been ferocious and disproportioned whether there had not been more abuse on the part of the law in respect to the penalty than there had been on the part of the culprit in respect to his fault, whether there had not been an excess of weights in one balance of the scale, in the one which contains expiation, whether the overweight of the penalty was not equivalent to the annihilation of the crime, and did not result in reversing the situation, of replacing the fault of the delinquent by the fault of the repression, of converting the guilty man into the victim, and the debtor into the creditor, and of ranging the law definitely on the side of the man who had violated it. Whether this penalty, complicated by successive aggravations for attempts at escape, had not ended in becoming a sort of outrage perpetrated by the stronger upon the feebler, a crime of society against the individual, a crime which was being committed afresh every day, a crime which had lasted nineteen years. He asked himself whether human society could have the right to force its members to suffer equally in one case for its own unreasonable lack of foresight, and in the other case for its pitiless foresight, and to seize a poor man forever between a defect and an excess, a default of work and an excess of punishment. Whether it was not outrageous for society to treat thus precisely those of its members who were the least well endowed in the division of goods made by chance, 
and consequently the most deserving of consideration. These questions put and answered, he judged society and condemned it. He condemned it to his hatred. He made it responsible for the fate which he was suffering, and he said to himself that it might be that one day he should not hesitate to call it to account. He declared to himself that there was no equilibrium between the harm which he had caused and the harm which was being done to him. He finally arrived at the conclusion that his punishment was not in truth unjust, but that it most assuredly was iniquitous. Anger may be both foolish and absurd. One can be irritated wrongfully. One is exasperated only when there is some show of right on one side at bottom. Jean Valjean felt himself exasperated. And besides, human society had done him nothing but harm. He had never seen anything of it save that angry face which it calls justice, and which it shows to those whom it strikes. Men had only touched him to bruise him. Every contact with them had been a blow. Never since his infancy, since the days of his mother, of his sister, had he ever encountered a friendly word and a kindly glance. From suffering to suffering he had gradually arrived at the conviction that life is a war, and that in this war he was the conquered. He had no other weapon than his hate. He resolved to wet it in the galleys, and to bear it away with him when he departed. There was at Toulon a school for the convicts, kept by the ignorantine friars, where the most necessary branches were taught to those of the unfortunate men who had a mind for them. He was of the number who had a mind. He went to school at the age of forty, and learned to read, to write, to cipher. He felt that to fortify his intelligence was to fortify his hate. In certain cases, education and enlightenment can serve to eke out evil. This is a sad thing to say. After having judged society, which had caused his unhappiness, he judged providence, which had made society, and he condemned it also. Thus, during nineteen years of torture and slavery, this soul mounted and at the same time fell. Light entered it on one side, and darkness on the other. Jean Valjean had not, as we have seen, an evil nature. He was still good when he arrived at the galleys. He there condemned society, and felt that he was becoming wicked. He there condemned providence, and was conscious that he was becoming impious. It is difficult not to indulge in meditation at this point. Does human nature thus change utterly and from top to bottom? Can the man created good by God be rendered wicked by man? Can the soul be completely made over by fate and become evil, fate being evil? Can the heart become misshapen and contract incurable deformities and infirmities under the oppression of a disproportionate unhappiness, as a verbal column beneath too low a vault? Is there not in every human soul, was there not in the soul of Jean Valjean in particular, a first spark, a divine element, incorruptible in this world, immortal in the other, which good can develop, fan, ignite, and make to glow with splendor, and which evil can never wholly extinguish? Grave and obscure questions, to the last of which every physiologist would probably have responded no, and that without hesitation, had he beheld it too long, during the hours of repose, which were for Jean Valjean hours of reverie, this gloomy galley slave, seated with folded arms upon the bar of some capstan, with the end of his chain thrust into his pocket to prevent its dragging, serious, silent, and thoughtful, a pariah of the laws which regarded the man with wrath, condemned by civilization, and regarding heaven with severity. Certainly, and we make no attempt to dissimulate the fact, the observing physiologist would have beheld an irremediable misery. He would, perchance, have pitied this sick man of the law's making, but he would not have even essayed any treatment. He would have turned aside his gaze from the caverns of which he would have caught a glimpse within this soul, and, like Dante at the portals of hell, he would have effaced from this existence the word which the finger of God has, nevertheless, inscribed upon the brow of every man, hope. Was this state of his soul, which we have attempted to analyze, as perfectly clear to Jean Valjean as we have tried to render it for those who read us? Did Jean Valjean distinctly perceive, after their formation, and had he seen distinctly during the process of their formation, all the elements of which his moral misery was composed? Had this rough and unlettered man gathered a perfectly clear perception 
of the succession of ideas through which he had by degrees mounted and descended to the lugubrious aspects which had for so many years formed the inner horizon of his spirit was he conscious of all that passed within him and of all that was working there that is something which we do not presume to state it is something which we do not even believe there was too much ignorance in jean valjean even after his misfortune to prevent much vagueness from still lingering there at times he did not rightly know himself what he felt jean valjean was in the shadows he suffered in the shadows he hated in the shadows one might have said that he hated in advance of himself he dwelt habitually in this shadow feeling his way like a blind man and a dreamer only at intervals there suddenly came to him from without and from within an access of wrath a surcharge of suffering a livid and rapid flash which illuminated his whole soul and caused to appear abruptly all around him in front behind amid the gleams of a frightful light the hideous precipices and the sombre perspective of his destiny the flash passed the night closed in again and where was he he no longer knew the peculiarity of pains of this nature in which that which is pitiless that is to say that which is brutalizing predominates is to transform a man little by little by a sort of stupid transfiguration into a wild beast sometimes into a ferocious beast jean valjean's successive and obstinate attempts at escape would alone suffice to prove this strange working of the law upon the human soul jean valjean would have renewed these attempts utterly useless and foolish as they were as often as the opportunity had presented itself without reflecting for an instant on the result nor on the experiences which he had already gone through he escaped impetuously like the wolf who finds his cage open instinct said to him flee reason would have said remain but in the presence of so violent a temptation reason vanished nothing remained but instinct the beast alone acted when he was recaptured the fresh severities inflicted on him only served to render him still more wild one detail which we must not omit is that he possessed a physical strength which was not approached by a single one of the denizens of the galleys at work at paying out cable or winding up a capstan jean valjean was worth four men he sometimes lifted and sustained enormous weights on his back and when the occasion demanded it he replaced that implement which is called a jack screw and was formerly called orgoil pride whence we may remark in passing is derived the name of the rue montorgoil near the halle a fish market in paris once when they were repairing the balcony of the town hall at toulon one of those admirable caryatids of puget which support the balcony became loosened and was on the point of falling jean valjean who was present supported the caryatid with his shoulder and gave the workmen time to arrive his suppleness even exceeded his strength certain convicts who were forever dreaming of escape ended by making a veritable science of force and skill combined it is the science of muscles an entire system of mysterious statics is daily practiced by prisoners men who are forever envious of the flies and birds to climb a vertical surface and to find points of support where hardly a projection was visible was play to jean valjean an angle of the wall being given with a tension of his back and legs with his elbows and his heels fitted into the unevenness of the stone he raised himself as if by magic to the third story he sometimes mounted thus even to the roof of the galley prison he spoke but little he laughed not at all an excessive emotion was required to wring from him once or twice a year that lugubrious laugh of the convict which is like the echo of the laugh of a demon to all appearance he seemed to be occupied in the constant contemplation of something terrible he was absorbed in fact athwart the unhealthy perceptions of an incomplete nature and a crushed intelligence he was confusedly conscious that some monstrous thing was resting on him in that obscure and wan shadow within which he crawled each time that he turned his neck and essayed to raise his glance he perceived with terror mingled with rage a sort of frightful accumulation of things collecting and mounting above him beyond the range of his vision laws prejudices men and deeds whose outlines escaped him whose mass terrified him and which was nothing else than that prodigious pyramid which we call civilization 
He distinguished here and there in that swarming and formless mass, now near him, now afar off and on inaccessible table-lands, some group, some detail, vividly illuminated. Here the galley sergeant and his cudgel, there the gendarme and his sword, yonder the mitred archbishop, away at the top, like a sort of sun, the emperor crowned and dazzling. It seemed to him that these distant splendors, far from dissipating his night, rendered it more funereal and more black. All this, laws, prejudices, deeds, men, things, went and came above him, over his head, in accordance with the complicated and mysterious movement which God imparts to civilization, walking over him and crushing him with I know not what peacefulness in its cruelty and inexorability in its indifference. Souls which have fallen to the bottom of all possible misfortune, unhappy men lost in the lowest of those limbos at which no one any longer looks, the reproved of the law, feel the whole weight of this human society, so formidable for him who is without, so frightful for him who is beneath, resting upon their heads. In this situation Jean Valjean meditated, and what could be the nature of his meditation? If the grain of millet beneath the millstone had thoughts, it would, doubtless, think that same thing which Jean Valjean thought. All these things, realities full of spectres, phantasmagories full of realities, had eventually created for him a sort of interior state which is almost indescribable. At times, amid his convict toil, he paused. He fell to thinking. His reason, at one and the same time riper and more troubled than of yore, rose in revolt. Everything which had happened to him seemed to him absurd. Everything that surrounded him seemed to him impossible. He said to himself, It is a dream. He gazed at the galley sergeant standing a few paces from him. The galley sergeant seemed a phantom to him. All of a sudden the phantom dealt him a blow with his cudgel. Visible nature hardly existed for him. It would almost be true to say that there existed for Jean Valjean neither sun, nor fine summer days, nor radiant sky, nor fresh April dawns. I know not what vent-hole daylight habitually illumined his soul. To sum up, in conclusion, that which can be summed up and translated into positive results in all that we have just pointed out, we will confine ourselves to the statement that, in the course of nineteen years, Jean Valjean, the inoffensive tree-pruner of Faverolles, the formidable convict of Toulon, had become capable, thanks to the manner in which the galleys had molded him, of two sorts of evil action. Firstly, of evil action which was rapid, unpremeditated, dashing, entirely instinctive, in the nature of reprisals for the evil which he had undergone. Secondly, of evil action which was serious, grave, consciously argued out and premeditated, with the false ideas which such a misfortune can furnish. His deliberate deeds pass through three successive phases, which natures of a certain stamp can alone traverse, reasoning, will, perseverance. He had for moving causes his habitual wrath, bitterness of soul, a profound sense of indignity suffered, the reaction even against the good, the innocent, and the just, if there are any such. The point of departure, like the point of arrival for all his thoughts, was hatred of human law, that hatred which, if it be not arrested in its development by some providential incident, becomes, within a given time, the hatred of society, then the hatred of the human race, then the hatred of creation, and which manifests itself by a vague, incessant, and brutal desire to do harm to some living being, no matter whom. It will be perceived that it was not without reason that Jean Valjean's passport described him as a very dangerous man. From year to year this soul had dried away slowly, but with fatal sureness. When the heart is dry, the eye is dry. On his departure from the galleys, it had been nineteen years since he had shed a tear. End of Book Two, Chapter Seven. Book Two, Chapter Eight of Les Misérables, translated by Isabel F. Hapgood. Les Misérables by Victor Hugo. Book Two, The Fall. Chapter 8. Billows and Shadows A man overboard! What matters it? The vessel does not halt. The wind blows. That somber ship has a path which it is forced to pursue. It passes on. 
The man disappears, then reappears. He plunges, he rises again to the surface. He calls, he stretches out his arms. He is not heard. The vessel, trembling under the hurricane, is wholly absorbed in its own workings. The passengers and sailors do not even see the drowning man. His miserable head is but a speck amid the immensity of the waves. He gives vent to desperate cries from out of the depths. What a spectre is that retreating sail! He gazes and gazes at it frantically. It retreats, it grows dim, it diminishes in size. He was there but just now, he was one of the crew. He went and came along the deck with the rest, he had his part of breath and of sunlight. He was a living man. Now what has taken place? He has slipped, he has fallen. All is at an end. He is in the tremendous sea. Underfoot he has nothing but what flees and crumbles. The billows, torn and lashed by the wind, encompass him hideously. The tossings of the abyss bear him away. All the tongues of water dash over his head. A populace of waves spits upon him. Confused openings half devour him. Every time that he sinks, he catches glimpses of precipices filled with night. Frightful and unknown vegetation seize him, not about his feet, draw him to them. He is conscious that he is becoming an abyss, that he forms part of the foam. The waves toss him from one to another. He drinks in the bitterness. The cowardly ocean attacks him furiously to drown him. The enormity plays with his agony. It seems as though all that water were hate. Nevertheless, he struggles. He tries to defend himself. He tries to sustain himself. He makes an effort. He swims. He, his petty strength all exhausted instantly, combats the inexhaustible. Where then is the ship? Yonder, barely visible in the pale shadows of the horizon. The wind blows in gusts. All the foam overwhelms him. He raises his eyes and beholds only the lividness of the clouds. He witnesses amid his death pangs the immense madness of the sea. He is tortured by this madness. He hears noises strange to man, which seem to come from beyond the limits of the earth, and from one knows not what frightful region beyond. There are birds in the clouds, just as there are angels above human distresses. But what can they do for him? They sing and fly and float. And he, he rattles in the death agony. He feels himself buried in those two infinities, the ocean and the sky, at one and the same time. The one is a tomb, the other is a shroud. Night descends. He has been swimming for hours. His strength is exhausted. That ship, that distant thing in which there were men, has vanished. He is alone in the formidable twilight gulf. He sinks, he stiffens himself, he twists himself. He feels under him the monstrous billows of the invisible. He shouts. There are no more men. Where is God? He shouts, Help! Help! He still shouts on. Nothing on the horizon, nothing in heaven. He implores the expanse, the waves, the seaweed, the reef. They are deaf. He beseeches the tempest. The imperturbable tempest obeys only the infinite. Around him, Darkness, fog, solitude, the stormy and non-sentient tumult, the undefined curling of those wild waters. In him, horror 
and fatigue. Beneath him, the depths, not a point of support. He thinks of the gloomy adventures of the corpse in the limitless shadow. The bottomless cold paralyzes him. His hands contract convulsively. They close and grasp nothingness. Winds, clouds, whirlwinds, gusts, useless stars. What is to be done? The desperate man gives up. He is weary. He chooses the alternative of death. He resists not. He lets himself go. He abandons his grip. And then he tosses forevermore in the lugubrious, dreary depths of engulfment. O oh, implacable march of human societies! O oh, losses of men and of souls on the way! Ocean into which falls all that the law lets slip! Disastrous absence of help! O oh, moral death! The sea is the inexorable social night into which the penal laws fling their condemned. The sea is the immensity of wretchedness. The soul going downstream in this gulf may become a corpse. Who shall resuscitate it? End of Book Two, Chapter Eight. Book Two, Chapter Nine of Les Miserables, translated by Isabel F. Hapgood. Book Two, Chapter Nine. New Troubles. When the hour came for him to take his departure from the galleys, when Jean Valjean heard in his ear the strange words, Thou art free! The moment seemed improbable and unprecedented. A ray of vivid light, a ray of the true light of the living, suddenly penetrated within him. But it was not long before this ray paled. Jean Valjean had been dazzled by the idea of liberty. He had believed in a new life. He very speedily perceived what sort of liberty it is to which a yellow passport is provided. And this was encompassed with much bitterness. He had calculated that his earnings during his sojourn in the galleys ought to amount to 171 francs. It is but just to add that he had forgotten to include in his calculations the forced repose of Sundays and festival days during nineteen years, which entailed a diminution of about eighty francs. At all events, his hoard had been reduced by various local levies to the sum of one hundred and nine francs fifteen sous, which had been counted out to him on his departure. He had understood nothing of this, and had thought himself wronged let us say the word, robbed. On the day following his liberation, he saw at Grasse, in front of an orange-flower distillery, some men engaged in unloading bales. He offered his services. Business was pressing. They were accepted. He set to work. He was intelligent, robust, adroit. He did his best. The master seemed pleased. While he was at work, a gendarme passed, observed him, and demanded his papers. It was necessary to show him the yellow passport. That done, Jean Valjean resumed his labor. A little while before, he had questioned one of the workmen as to the amount which they earned each day at this occupation. He had been told thirty sous. When evening arrived, as he was forced to set out again on the following day, he presented himself to the owner of the distillery and requested to be paid. The owner did not utter a word, but handed him fifteen sous. He objected. He was told, That is enough for thee. He persisted. The master looked him straight between the eyes and said to him, Beware of the prison. There again he considered that he had been robbed. Society, the state, by diminishing his hoard, had robbed him wholesale. Now it was the individual who was robbing him at retail. Liberation is not deliverance. One gets free from the galleys, but not from the sentence. That is what happened to him at Grasse. 
We have seen in what manner he was received at Dinya. End of Book 2, Chapter 9 Book 2, Chapter 10 of Les Miserables Translated by Isabel F. Hapgood This is a LibriVox recording. Les Miserables by Victor Hugo Book 2, The Fall Chapter 10, The Man Aroused as the cathedral clock struck two in the morning, Jean Valjean awoke. What woke him was that his bed was too good. It was nearly twenty years since he had slept in a bed, and, although he had not undressed, the sensation was too novel not to disturb his slumbers. He had slept more than four hours. His fatigue had passed away. He was accustomed not to devote many hours to repose. He opened his eyes and stared into the gloom which surrounded him. Then he closed them again with the intention of going to sleep once more. When many varied sensations have agitated the day, when various matters preoccupy the mind, one falls asleep once, but not a second time. Sleep comes more easily than it returns. This is what happened to Jean Valjean. He could not get to sleep again, and he fell to thinking. He was at one of those moments when the thoughts which one has in one's mind are troubled. There was a sort of dark confusion in his brain. His memories of the olden time and of the immediate present floated there pell-mell and mingled confusedly, losing their proper forms, becoming disproportionately large, then suddenly disappearing as in a muddy and perturbed pool. Many thoughts occurred to him, but there was one which kept constantly presenting itself afresh, and which drove away all others. We will mention this thought at once. He had observed the six sets of silver forks and spoons, and the ladle, which Madame Magloire had placed on the table. Those six sets of silver haunted him. They were there, a few paces distant. Just as he was traversing the adjoining room to reach the one in which he then was, the old servant-woman had been in the act of placing them in a little cupboard near the head of the bed. He had taken careful note of this cupboard. On the right, as you entered from the dining-room, they were solid and old silver. From the ladle one could get at least two hundred francs, double what he had earned in nineteen years. It is true that he would have earned more if the administration had not robbed him. His mind wavered for a whole hour in fluctuations, with which there was certainly mingled some struggle. Three o'clock struck. He opened his eyes again, drew himself up abruptly into a sitting posture, stretched out his arm and felt of his knapsack, which he had thrown down on a corner of the alcove, then he hung his legs over the edge of the bed, and placed his feet on the floor, and thus found himself, almost without knowing it, seated on his bed. He remained for a time thoughtfully in this attitude, which would have been suggestive of something sinister for any one who had seen him thus in the dark, the only person awake in that house where all was sleeping. All of a sudden he stooped down, removed his shoes, and placed them softly on the mat beside the bed. Then he resumed his thoughtful attitude, and became motionless once more. Throughout this hideous meditation, the thoughts which we have above indicated moved incessantly through his brain, entered, withdrew, re-entered, and in a manner oppressed him. And then he thought, also, without knowing why, and with the mechanical persistence of reverie of a convict named Brevet, whom he had known in the galleys, and whose trousers had been upheld by a single suspender of knitted cotton. The checkered pattern of that suspender recurred incessantly to his mind. He remained in this situation, and would have so remained indefinitely, even until daybreak, had not the clock struck one, the half or quarter hour. It seemed to him that that stroke said to him, Come on. 
He rose to his feet, hesitated still another moment, and listened. All was quiet in the house. Then he walked straight ahead with short steps to the window, of which he caught a glimpse. The night was not very dark. There was a full moon, across which coursed large clouds driven by the wind. This created outdoors alternate shadow and gleams of light, eclipses, then bright openings of the clouds, and indoors a sort of twilight. This twilight, sufficient to enable a person to see his way, intermittent on account of the clouds, resembled the sort of livid light which falls through an air hole in a cellar, before which the passer-by come and go. On arriving at the window, Jean Valjean examined it. It had no grating. It opened in the garden, and was fastened, according to the fashion of the country, only by a small pin. He opened it, but as a rush of cold and piercing air penetrated the room abruptly, he closed it again immediately. He scrutinized the garden with that attentive gaze which studies rather than looks. The garden was enclosed by a tolerably low white wall, easy to climb. Far away, at the extremity, he perceived tops of trees spaced at regular intervals, which indicated that the wall separated the garden from an avenue or lane planted with trees. Having taken this survey, he executed a movement like that of a man who has made up his mind, strode to his alcove, grasped his knapsack, opened it, fumbled in it, pulled out of it something which he placed on the bed, put his shoes into one of his pockets, shut the whole thing up again, threw the knapsack on his shoulders, put on his cap, drew the visor down over his eyes, felt for his cudgel, went and placed it in the angle of the window, then returned to the bed, and resolutely seized the object which he had deposited there. It resembled a short bar of iron, pointed like a pike at one end. It would have been difficult to distinguish in that darkness for what employment that bit of iron could have been designed. Perhaps it was a lever, possibly it was a club. In the daytime it would have been possible to recognize it as nothing more than a miner's candlestick. Convicts were, at that period, sometimes employed in quarrying stone from the lofty hills which environed Toulon, and it was not rare for them to have miner's tools at their command. These miners' candlesticks are of massive iron, terminated at the lower extremity by a point, by means of which they are stuck into the rock. He took the candlestick in his right hand. Holding his breath and trying to deaden the sound of his tread, he directed his steps to the door of the adjoining room, occupied by the bishop, as we already know. On arriving at this door, he found it ajar. The bishop had not closed it. End of Book Two, Chapter Ten. Les Misérables, by Victor Hugo. Book Two, Chapter Eleven. What he does. Jean Valjean listened. Not a sound. He gave the door a push. He pushed it gently with the tip of his finger, lightly with the furtive and uneasy gentleness of a cat. Which is desirous of entering. The door yielded to this pressure, and made an imperceptible and silent movement, which enlarged the opening a little. He waited a moment, then gave the door a second and a bolder push. It continued to yield in silence. The opening was now large enough to allow him to pass, but near the door there stood a little table. Which formed an embarrassing angle with it, and barred the entrance. Jean Valjean recognized the difficulty. It was necessary, at any cost, to enlarge the aperture still further. He decided on his course of action and gave the door a third push, more energetic than the two preceding. This time, a badly oiled hinge suddenly emitted amid the silence a hoarse and prolonged cry. Jean Valjean shuddered. 
the noise of the hinge rang in his ears with something of the piercing and formidable sound of the trumpet of the day of judgment in the fantastic exaggerations of the first moment he almost imagined that the hinge had just become animated and had suddenly assumed a terrible life and that it was barking like a dog to arouse every one and warn and to wake those who were asleep he halted shuddering bewildered and fell back from the tips of his toes upon his heels he heard the arteries in his temples beating like two forge hammers and it seemed to him that his breath issued from his breast with the roar of the wind issuing from a cavern it seemed impossible to him that the horrible clamor of that irritated hinge should not have disturbed the entire household. Like the shock of an earthquake, the door, pushed by him, had taken the alarm, and had shouted. The old man would rise at once, the two old women would shriek out, people would come to their assistance. In less than a quarter of an hour, the town would be in an uproar, and the gendarmerie on hand. For a moment he thought himself lost. He remained where he was, petrified like the statue of salt, not daring to make a movement. Several minutes elapsed. The door had fallen wide open. He ventured to peep into the next room. Nothing had stirred there. He lent an ear. Nothing was moving in the house. The noise made by the rusty hinge had not awakened any one. This first danger was past, but there still reigned a frightful tumult within him. Nevertheless, he did not retreat. Even when he had thought himself lost, he had not drawn back. His only thought now was to finish as soon as possible. He took a step and entered the room. This room was in a state of perfect calm. Here and there, vague and confused forms were distinguishable, which in the daylight were papers scattered on a table, open folios, volumes piled upon a stool, an armchair heaped with clothing, a prie-dieu, and which at that hour were only shadowy corners and whitish spots. Jean Valjean advanced with precaution taking care not to knock against the furniture. He could hear at the extremity of the room the even and tranquil breathing of the sleeping bishop. He suddenly came to a halt. He was near the bed. He had arrived there sooner than he had thought for. Nature sometimes mingles her effects and her spectacles with our actions, with somber and intelligent appropriateness as though she desired to make us reflect. For the last half hour a large cloud had covered the heavens. At that moment, when Jean Valjean paused in front of the bed, this cloud parted, as though on purpose, and a ray of light, traversing the long window, suddenly illuminated the bishop's pale face. He was sleeping peacefully. He lay in his bed almost completely dressed, on account of the cold of the Basque Alps. In a garment of brown wool, in which covered his arms to the wrists. His head was thrown back on the pillow, in the careless attitude of repose, his hand adorned with the pastoral ring, and whence had fallen so many good deeds, and so many holy actions, was hanging over the edge of the bed. His whole face was illumined with a vague expression of satisfaction, of hope and of felicity. It was more than a smile, and almost a radiance. He bore upon his brow the indescribable reflection of a light which was invisible. The soul of the just contemplates in sleep a mysterious heaven. A reflection of that heaven rested on the bishop. It was, at the same time, a luminous transparency for that heaven was within him. That heaven was his conscience. At the moment when the ray of moonlight superposed itself, so to speak, upon that inward radiance, the sleeping bishop seemed as in a glory. It remained, however, gentle and veiled in an ineffable half-light. 
that moon in the sky that slumbering nature that garden without a quiver that house which was so calm the hour the moment the silence added some solemn and unspeakable quality to the venerable repose of this man and enveloped in a sort of serene and majestic aureole of white hair those closed eyes that face in which all was hope and all was confidence that head of an old man and that slumber of an infant there was something almost divine in this man who was thus august without being himself aware of it jean valjean was in the shadow and stood motionless with his iron candlestick in his hand frightened by this luminous old man never had he beheld anything like this this confidence terrified him the moral world has no grander spectacle than this a troubled and uneasy conscience which has arrived on the brink of an evil action contemplating the slumber of the just that slumber in that isolation and with a neighbor like himself had about it something sublime of which he was vaguely but imperiously conscious no one could have told what was passing within him not even himself in order to attempt to form an idea of it it is necessary to think of the most violent of things in the presence of the most gentle even on his visage it would have been impossible to distinguish anything with certainty it was a sort of haggard astonishment he gazed at it and that was all but what was his thought it would have been impossible to divine it what was evident was that he had been touched and astounded but what was the nature of this emotion his eye never quitted the old man the only thing which was clearly to be inferred from his attitude and his signiomy was a strange indecision one would have said that he was hesitating between the two abysses the one in which one loses oneself and that in which one saves oneself he seemed prepared to crush that skull or kiss that hand at the expiration of a few minutes his left arm rose slowly towards his brow and he took off his cap then his arm fell back with the same deliberation and jean valjean fell to meditating once more his cap in his left hand his club in his right hand his hair bristling all over his savage head the bishop continued to sleep in profound peace beneath that terrifying gaze the gleam of the moon rendered confusedly visible the crucifix over the chimney-piece which seemed to be extending its arms to both of them with a benediction for one and pardon for the other suddenly jean valjean replaced his cap on his brow then stepped rapidly past the bed without glancing at this bishop straight to the cupboard which he saw near the head he raised his iron candlestick as though to force the lock the key was there he opened it the first thing which presented itself to him was the basket of silverware he seized it traversed the chamber with long strides without taking any precautions and without troubling himself at the noise gained the door re-entered the oratory opened the window seized his cudgel bestrode the window-sill of the ground floor put the silver into his knapsack threw away the basket crossed the garden leaped over the wall like a tiger and fled end of book two chapter eleven of les miserables by victor hugo les miserables by victor hugo Book Two, Chapter Twelve. The Bishop Works. The next morning at sunrise, Monseigneur Benvenu was strolling in his garden. Madame Magloire ran up to him in utter consternation. Monseigneur, Monseigneur! She exclaimed, "Does your Grace know where the basket of silver is?" "Yes," replied the Bishop. "Jesus, the Lord be praised!" She resumed. I did not know what had become of it. 
The bishop had just picked up the basket in a flower bed. He presented it to Madame Magloire. Here it is. Well, said she, nothing in it. And the silver? Ah, returned the bishop, so it is the silver which troubles you. I don't know where it is. Great good God! It is stolen! That man who was here last night has stolen it! In a twinkling, with all the vivacity of an alert old woman, Madame Magloire had rushed to the oratory, entered the alcove, and returned to the bishop. The bishop had just bent down, and was sighing, as he examined a plant of Coquelaia de Guion, which the basket had broken as it fell across the bed. He rose up at Madame Magloire's cry. "'Monseigneur, the man is gone! The silver has been stolen!' As she uttered this exclamation, her eyes fell upon a corner of the garden, where traces of the wall having been scaled were visible. The coping of the wall had been torn away. "'Stay! Yonder is the way he went! He jumped over into Cochefilet Lane! Ah, the abomination! He has stolen our silver!' The bishop remained silent for a moment. Then he raised his grave eyes, and said gently to Madame Magloire, "'And in the first place was that silver ours?' Madame Magloire was speechless. Another silence ensued. Then the bishop went on. "'Madame Magloire, I have for a long time detained that silver wrongfully. It belonged to the poor.' "'Who was that man? A poor man, evidently.' "'Alas! Jesus!' returned Madame Magloire. "'It is not for my sake, nor for Mademoiselle's. It makes no difference to us, but it is for the sake of Monseigneur. What is Monseigneur to eat with now?' The bishop gazed at her with an air of amazement. "'Ah, come! Are there no such things as pewter forks and spoons?' Madame Magloire shrugged her shoulders. "'Pewter has an odour.' "'Iron forks and spoons, then.' Madame Magloire made an expressive grimace. "'Iron has a taste.' "'Very well,' said the bishop. "'Wooden ones, then.' A few moments later, as he was breakfasting at the very table at which Jean Valjean had sat on the previous evening. As he ate his breakfast, Monseigneur Welcome remarked gaily to his sister, who said nothing, and to Madame Magloire, who was grumbling under her breath, that one really does not need either fork or spoon, even of wood, in order to dip a bit of bread in a cup of milk. "'A pretty idea, truly,' said Madame Magloire to herself, as she came and went. "'To take a man in like that, and to lodge him close to oneself, and how fortunate that he did nothing but steal! Ah, mon Dieu, it makes one shudder to think of it!' As the brother and sister were about to rise from the table, there came a knock at the door. "'Come in,' said the bishop. The door opened. A singular and violent group made its appearance on the threshold. Three men were holding a fourth man by the collar. The three men were Jean d'Arme. The other was Jean Valjean. A brigadier of Jean d'Arme, who seemed to be in command of the group, was standing near the door. He entered and advanced to the bishop, making a military salute. Monseigneur, said he. At this word, Jean Valjean, who was dejected and seemed overwhelmed, raised his head with an air of stupefaction. Monseigneur, he murmured, so he is not the cure. Silence, said the Jean d'Arme. He is the Monseigneur, the bishop. In the meantime, Monseigneur Benvenu had advanced as quickly as his great age permitted. "'Ah, here you are!' he exclaimed, looking at Jean Valjean. "'I am glad to see you. "'Well, but how is this? "'I gave you the candlesticks, too, which are of silver like the rest, "'and for which you can certainly get two hundred francs. "'Why did you not carry them away with your forks and spoons?' Jean Valjean opened his eyes wide, and stared at the venerable bishop with an expression which no human tongue can render any account of. "'Monseigneur,' said the brigadier of gendarmes, 
So what this man said is true, then? We came across him. He was walking like a man who is running away. We stopped him to look into the matter. He had the silver. And he told you, interposed the bishop with a smile, that it had been given him by a kind old fellow of a priest with whom he had passed the night. I see how the matter stands, and you have brought him back here. It is a mistake. In that case, replied the brigadier, we can let him go? Certainly, replied the bishop. The Jean de Arme released Jean Valjean, who recoiled. Is it true that I am to be released? he said, in an almost inarticulate voice, and as though he were talking in his sleep. Yes, thou art released, dost thou not understand? said one of the Jean de Arms. My friend, resumed the bishop, before you go, here are your candlesticks. Take them. He stepped to the chimney piece, took the two silver candlesticks, and brought them to Jean Valjean. The two women looked on without uttering a word, without a gesture, without a look which could disconcert the bishop. Jean Valjean was trembling in every limb. He took the two candlesticks mechanically and with a bewildered air. Now, said the bishop, go in peace. By the way, when you return, my friend, it is not necessary to pass through the garden. You can always enter and depart through the street door. It is never fastened with anything but a latch, either by day or by night. Then returning to the Jeanne d'Arms, you may retire, gentlemen. The Jeanne d'Arms retired. Jean Valjean was like a man on the point of fainting. The bishop drew near to him and said in a low voice, Do not forget, never forget, that you have promised to use this money in becoming an honest man. Jean Valjean, who had no recollection of ever having promised anything, remained speechless. The bishop had emphasized the words when he uttered them. He resumed with solemnity, Jean Valjean, my brother, you are no longer belong to evil, but to good. It is your soul that I buy from you. I withdraw it from black thoughts and the spirit of perdition, and I give it to God. End of Book 2, Chapter 12 of Les Miserables by Victor Hugo Book 2, of Chapter 13 of Les Miserables Les Miserables by Victor Hugo Translated by Isabel F. Hapgood Book 2, Chapter 13 Little Gervais Jean Valjean left the town as though he were fleeing from it. He set out at a very hasty pace through the fields, taking whatever roads and paths presented themselves to him, without perceiving that he was incessantly retracing his steps. He wandered thus the whole morning without having eaten anything and without feeling hungry. He was the prey of a throng of novel sensations. He was conscious of a sort of rage. He did not know against whom it was directed. He could not have told whether he was touched or humiliated. There came over him at moments a strange emotion which he resisted and to which he opposed the hardness acquired during the last twenty years of his life. This state of mind fatigued him. He perceived with dismay that the sort of frightful calm which the injustice of his misfortune had conferred upon him was giving way within him. He asked himself what would replace this. At times he would have actually preferred to be in prison with a gendarme, and that things should not have happened in this way. It would have agitated him less. Although the season was tolerably far advanced, there were still a few late flowers in the hedgerows here and there, whose odor as he passed through them in his march recalled to him memories of his childhood. These memories were almost intolerable to him. It was so long since they had recurred to him. Unutterable thoughts assembled within him in this manner all day long. As the sun declined to its setting, 
casting long shadows athwart the soil from every pebble. Jean Valjean sat down behind a bush upon a large ruddy plain, which was absolutely deserted. There was nothing on the horizon except the Alps, not even the spire of a distant village. Jean Valjean might have been three leagues distant from D. A path which intersected the plains passed a few paces from the bush. In the middle of this meditation, which would have contributed not a little to render his rags terrifying to anyone who might have encountered him, a joyous sound became audible. He turned his head and saw a little Savoyard, about ten years of age, coming up the path and singing, his hurdy-gurdy on his hip and his marmo box on his back. One of those gay and gentle children who go from land to land, affording a view of their knees through the holes in their trousers. Without stopping his song, the lad halted in his march from time to time and played at knucklebones with some coins which he had in his hand, his whole fortune, probably. Among this money, there was one forty-sou piece. The child halted beside the bush, without perceiving Jean Valjean, and tossed up his handful of sous, which, up to that time, he had caught with a good deal of adroitness on the back of his hand. This time, the forty-sou piece escaped him, and went rolling toward the brushwood until it reached Jean Valjean. Jean Valjean set his foot upon it. In the meantime, the child had looked after his coin and had caught sight of him. He showed no astonishment, but walked straight up to the man. The spot was absolutely solitary. As far as the eye could see, there was not a person on the plain or on the path. The only sound was the tiny, feeble cries of a flock of birds of passage which was traversing the heavens at an immense height. The child was standing with his back to the sun, which cast threads of gold in his hair, and empurpled with its blood-red gleam the savage face of Jean Valjean. Sir, said the little Savoyard, with that childish confidence which is composed of ignorance and innocence, my money what is your name? said Jean Valjean. Little Gervais, sir. Go away, said Jean Valjean. Sir, resumed the child, give me back my money. Jean Valjean dropped his head and made no reply. The child began again. My money, sir. Jean Valjean's eyes remained fixed on the earth. My piece of money, cried the child, my white piece, my silver. It seemed as though Jean Valjean did not hear him. The child grasped him by the collar of his blouse and shook him. At the same time, he made an effort to displace the big iron-shod shoe which rested on his treasure. I want my piece of money, my piece of forty sous. The child wept. Jean Valjean raised his head. He still remained seated. His eyes were troubled. He gazed out at the child in a sort of amazement. Then he stretched out his hand towards his cudgel and cried in a terrible voice, Who's there? I, sir, replied the child. Little Gervais, I, give me back my forty sous if you please. Take your foot away, sir, if you please. Then, irritated, though he was so small, and becoming almost menacing. Come now, will you take your foot away? Take your foot away, or we'll see. Ah, it's still you, said Jean Valjean, and rising abruptly to his feet, his foot still resting on the silver piece, he added, Will you take yourself off? The frightened child looked at him, then began to tremble from head to foot, and after a few moments of stupor, he set out running at his top speed without daring to turn his neck or to utter a cry. Nevertheless, 
Lack of breath forced him to halt after a certain distance, and Jean Valjean heard him sobbing in the midst of his own reverie. At the end of a few moments, the child had disappeared. The sun had set. The shadows were descending around Jean Valjean. He had eaten nothing all day. It is probable that he was feverish. He had remained standing, and he had not changed his attitude after the child's flight. The breath heaved his chest at long and irregular intervals. His gaze, fixed ten or twelve paces in front of him, seemed to be scrutinizing with profound attention the shape of an ancient fragment of blue earthenware which had fallen in the grass. All at once she shivered. He had just begun to feel the chill of evening. He settled his cap more firmly on his brow, sought mechanically to cross and button his blouse, advanced a step, and stopped to pick up his cudgel. At that moment he caught sight of the forty-sous piece, which his foot had half ground into the earth, and which was shining among the pebbles. It was as though he had received a galvanic shock. What is this? he muttered between his teeth. He recoiled three paces, then halted, without being able to detach his gaze from the spot which his foot had trodden but an instant before, as though the thing which lay glittering there in the gloom had been an open eye riveted upon him. At the expiration of a few moments, he darted convulsively toward the silver coin, seized it, and straightened himself up again, and began to gaze afar off over the plain, at the same time casting his eyes towards all points of the horizon, as he stood there erect and shivering, like a terrified wild animal which is seeking refuge. He saw nothing. Night was falling. The plain was cold and vague. Great banks of violet haze were rising in the gleam of the twilight. He said, Ah! and set out rapidly in the direction in which the child had disappeared. After about thirty paces he paused, looked about him, and saw nothing. Then he shouted with all his might, Little Gervais! Little Gervais! He paused and waited. There was no reply. The landscape was gloomy and deserted. He was encompassed by space. There was nothing around him but an obscurity in which his gaze was lost, and a silence which engulfed his voice. An icy north wind was blowing, and imparted to things around him a sort of lugubrious life. The bushes shook their thin little arms with incredible fury. One would have said that they were threatening and pursuing someone. He set out on his march again. Then he began to run, and from time to time he halted and shouted in that solitude with a voice which was the most formidable and the most disconsolate that it was possible to hear. Little Gervé! Little Gervé! Assuredly, if the child had heard him, he would have been alarmed and would have taken good care not to show himself. But the child was no doubt already far away. He encountered a priest on horseback. He stepped up to him and said, Monsieur le curé, have you seen a child pass? No, said the priest. One named Little Gervais. I have seen no one. He drew two five-franc pieces from his money bag and handed them to the priest. Monsieur le curé, this is for your poor people. Monsieur le curé, he was a little lad, about ten years old, with a marmot, I think, and a hurdy-gurdy, one of those Savoyards, you know. I have not seen him. Little Gervais, there are no villages here, can you tell me? If he is like what you say, my friend, he is a little stranger. Such persons pass through these parts, we know nothing of them. Jean Valjean seized two more coins of five francs, each with violence, and gave them to the priest. For your poor, he said. 
Then he added wildly, Monsieur l'abbé, have me arrested. I am a thief. The priest put spurs to his horse and fled in haste, much alarmed. Jean Valjean set out in a run, in the direction which he had first taken. In this way, he traversed a tolerably long distance, gazing, calling, shouting, but he met no one. Two or three times he ran across the plain, towards something which conveyed to him the effect of a human being reclining or crouching down. It turned out to be nothing but brushwood or rocks, nearly on a level with the earth. At length, at a spot where three paths intersected each other, he stopped. The moon had risen. He sent his gaze into the distance and shouted for the last time, Little Gervé! Little Gervé! Little Gervé! His shout died away in the midst, without even awaking an echo. He murmured yet once more, Little Gervé! But in a feeble and almost inarticulate voice, it was his last effort, but his legs gave way abruptly under him, as though an invisible power had suddenly overwhelmed him with the weight of his evil conscience. He fell, exhausted, on a large stone, his fists clenched in his hair, and his face on his knees, and he cried, I am a wretch! Then his heart burst, and he began to cry. It was the first time that he had wept in nineteen years. When Jean Valjean left the bishop's house, he was, as we have seen, quite thrown out of everything that had been his thought hitherto. He could not yield to the evidence of what was going on within him. He hardened himself against the angelic action and the gentle words of the old man, you have promised me to become an honest man. I buy your soul. I take it away from the spirit of perversity. I give it to the good God. This recurred to his mind unceasingly. To this celestial kindness he opposed pride, which is the fortress of evil within us. He was indistinctly conscious that the pardon of this priest was the greatest assault and the most formidable attack which had moved him yet. That his obduracy was finally settled if he resisted this clemency, that if he yielded he should be obliged to renounce that hatred with which the actions of other men had filled his soul through so many years, and which pleased him. That this time it was necessary to conquer or be conquered and that a struggle, a colossal and final struggle, had been begun between his viciousness and the goodness of that man. In the presence of these lights, he proceeded like a man who is intoxicated. As he walked thus with haggard eyes, did he have a distinct perception of what might result to him from his adventure at D? Did he understand all those mysterious murmurs which warn or importune the spirit at certain moments of life? Did a voice whisper in his ear that he had just passed the solemn hour of his destiny, that there were no longer remaining a middle course for him, that if he were not henceforth the best of men, he would be the worst, that it behooved him now, so to speak, to mount higher than the bishop? or fall lower than the convict, that if he wished to become good, he must become an angel, that if he wished to remain evil, he must become a monster? Here again, some questions must be put, which we have already put to ourselves elsewhere. Did he catch some shadow of all this in his thought, in a confused way? Misfortune certainly, as we have said, does form the education of the intelligence. Nevertheless, it is doubtful whether Jean Valjean was in a condition to disentangle all that we have here indicated. If these ideas occurred to him, 
he but caught glimpses of rather than saw them, and they only succeeded in throwing him into an unutterable and almost painful state of emotion on emerging from that black and deformed thing which is called the galleys the bishop had hurt his soul as too vivid a light would have hurt his eyes on emerging from the dark the future life the possible life which offered itself to him henceforth all pure and radiant filled him with tremors and anxiety he no longer knew where he really was like an owl who should suddenly see the sunrise the convict had been dazzled and blinded, as it were, by virtue. That which was certain, that which he did not doubt, was that he was no longer the same man, that everything about him was changed, that it was no longer in his power to make it as though the bishop had not spoken to him and had not touched him. In this state of mind he had encountered little Gervais, and had robbed him of his forty sous. Why? He certainly could not have explained it. Was this the last effect in the supreme effort, as it were, of the evil thoughts which he had brought away from the galleys, a remnant of impulse, a result of what is called in statics acquired force? It was that, and it was also perhaps even less than that. Let us say it simply. It was not he who stole. It was not the man. It was the beast, who, by habit and instinct, had simply placed his foot upon that money, while the intelligence was struggling amid so many novel and hitherto unheard-of thoughts besetting it. When intelligence reawakened and beheld that action of the brute, Jean Valjean recoiled with anguish and uttered a cry of terror. It was because, strange phenomenon, and one which was possible only in the situation in which he found himself, in stealing that money from that child, he had done a thing of which he was no longer capable. However that may be, this last evil action had a decisive effect on him. It abruptly traversed that chaos which he bore in his mind and dispersed it, placed on one side the thick obscurity and on the other the light, and acted on his soul. In the state in which it then was, as certain chemical reagents act upon a troubled mixture by precipitating one element and clarifying the other. First of all, even before examining himself and reflecting, all bewildered, like one who seeks to save himself, he tried to find the child in order to return his money to him. Then, when he recognized the fact that this was impossible, he halted in despair. At that moment when he exclaimed, I am a wretch. He had just perceived what he was, and he was already separated from himself to such a degree that he seemed to himself to be no longer anything more than a phantom, as if he had, therefore before him, in flesh and blood, the hideous galley convict, Jean Valjean, cudgel in hand, his blouse on his hips, his knapsack, filled with stolen objects on his back with his resolute and gloomy visage, with his thoughts filled with abominable projects. Excess of unhappiness had, as we have remarked, made him in some sort of a visionary. This, then, was in the nature of a vision. He actually saw that Jean Valjean, that sinister face, before him. He had almost reached the point of asking himself who that man was, and he was horrified by him. His brain was going through one of those violent and yet perfectly calm moments in which reverie is so profound that it absorbs reality. One no longer beholds the object which one has before one, and one sees, as though apart from oneself, the figures which one has in one's own mind. Thus he contemplated himself, so to speak, face to face, and at the same time, athwart this hallucination, he perceived in a mysterious depth a sort of light which he at first took for a torch. On scrutinizing this light which appeared to his conscience with more attention, he recognized the fact that it possessed a human form, and that this torch was the bishop. His conscience weighed in turn these two men thus placed before it the bishop and Jean Valjean. 
nothing less than the first was required to soften the second. By one of those singular effects, which are peculiar to this sort of ecstasies, in proportion, as his reverie continued, as the bishop grew great and resplendent in his eyes, so did Jean Valjean grow less and vanish. After a certain time, he was no longer anything more than a shade. All at once he disappeared. The bishop alone remained. He filled the whole soul of this wretched man with a magnificent radiance. Jean Valjean wept for a long time. He wept burning tears. He sobbed with more weakness than a woman, with more fright than a child. As he wept, daylight penetrated more and more clearly into his soul. An extraordinary light, a light at once ravishing and terrible. His past life, his first fault, his long expiation, his external brutishness, his internal hardness, his dismissal to liberty, rejoicing in manifold plans of vengeance, what had happened to him at the bishop's, the last thing that he had done, that theft of forty sous from a child, a crime all the more cowardly and all the more monstrous since it had come after the bishop's pardon. All this recurred to his mind and appeared clearly to him, but with a clearness which he had never hitherto witnessed. He examined his life, and it seemed horrible to him, his soul, and it seemed frightful to him. In the meantime, a gentle light rested over this life and this soul. It seemed to him that he had beheld Satan by the light of paradise. How many hours did he weep thus? What did he do after he wept? Whither did he go? No one ever knew. The only thing which seems to be authenticated is that that same night the carrier who served Grenoble at that epoch, who arrived at D, about three o'clock in the morning, saw, as he traversed the street in which the bishop's residence was situated, a man in the attitude of prayer, kneeling on that pavement in the shadow, in front of the door of Monseigneur Welcome. End of Book Two, Chapter Thirteen